Welcome, and uh, thank you, Michael, for bringing us all together, and particularly for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on transforming our economic institutions. Um, I think we all agree it would be nice to have economic institutions that actually support the values of the caring society we're talking about. Now, I think we're also very clear the extent to which our economic institutions reflect and shape our values and priorities as a society and as a species. And they bear a major responsibility for the economic, social, environmental, and political crises that currently threaten the very viability of our species. The really troubling aspect is once you get down beneath the surface, you begin to realize that our economic system is corrupt by design to favor the interests of Wall Street bankers and financiers. And too often, our attempts to deal with the consequences of the corruption do nothing to change that reality and may instead reinforce it. That's why it's so important to have this conversation we're having here. The politicians pour in money at the top into the Wall Street banks to keep them functioning. The banks then use that money in ways that depress employment and wages, hit the desperate with usurious interest rates, and throw people out of their homes. Then those of us dedicated to caring and compassion try to ameliorate the consequences at the bottom by donating to charities and demanding that government strengthen the safety net. But rarely asking why we have allowed the system to force people into desperation in the first place. We must address the system. You remember this phrase from, uh, from Clinton, you know, it's the economy stupid? <laughs> well, it is, but it is the economic system stupid. <laughs> now my job this morning is to share what I've learned about the institutional transformation we must now achieve. The changes required are so far reaching and so deep that success necessarily depends on a broad spiritual awakening, which is why I feel a deep affinity with Rabbi Lerner and with the network of spiritual progressives. Values of caring and compassion are essential, yet we must also be clear that they alone will not get us where we need to go, because our economic institutions have been designed by people whose moral code says that greed is a virtue and sharing is a sin. I've got a chapter in my new book that says, greed is not a virtue, sharing is not a sin. An extraordinary thing is it should not be necessary to point that out. Anyhow, they've designed the system to reward greed and to punish sharing. We're going to change that. Following the Wall Street financial meltdown in September 2008, um, I published an article in Tikkun making the case that we're dealing not with a broken economic system in need of repair, but rather a failed system designed to serve false values that must be replaced. That became the basis of the first edition of my book, Agenda for a New Economy from Phantom Wealth to Real Wealth, that launched immediately after the Obama inauguration. It was launched at a national conference in that historic Wall Street Trinity Church that faces down Wall Street. You've all seen the pictures. And few events in my life have given me a greater thrill than standing in the pulpit of that church looking down Wall Street and issuing a call to bring down the wall. Now, as I was writing the first edition of Agenda for a New Economy, I joined with John Cavana, who's sitting with us down here in the front row. John is the director of the Institute for Policy Studies here in DC, um, the, the, the oldest multi-issue uh, progressive think tank in, in the city. And we joined together to form what we call the New Economy Working Group, which is a partnership of the Institute for Policy Studies, Yes Magazine, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, and the People-Centered Development Forum. In order to further develop and popularize a coherent agenda for a democratic, market-based restructuring of our economic system and institutions supporting of positive values. We work from the same premise that Rabbi Lerner recommended yesterday. We do not limit ourselves to what is currently practical or politically feasible. 
Rather, we start from what is necessary and desirable. Then the task is to figure out how to make it not just politically feasible, but a political imperative for our politicians, one that they cannot ignore. Now, our subsequent discussions greatly increased the clarity and coherence of the analysis and framework for action, which became the basis for the new edition of Agenda for a New Economy, which we're launching here today at this conference, and it's for sale by uh, uh, Busboys and Poets, a bookstore in the lobby. So you will have the first copies available anywhere um, at this store. And I do want to note that because of the slow state of the uh, book distribution system, it won't be generally available in bookstores till, uh, till August 1. So I suggest you take advantage of this opportunity. If you need to get it later, check the Yes Magazine bookstore. We'll also have advanced copies on, on the web, yesmagazine.org. Okay, during this session, I will lay out the key elements of our new economy agenda, and immediately following, uh, for those who are interested, John Cavana, who co-chairs the New Economy Working Group, will be leading a breakout session panel discussion with Garl Purovitz, Heather Booth, Noel Ortega, and Rob Wiseman. Uh, I think you'll find this a fascinating uh, conversation. This will be partly about uh, how we're thinking about this and, and, and the, the implementation. Later this afternoon, Garo Pirovitz and I will team up for a mini plenary that uh, will take it to another level. We'll have much more time for discussion there with a particular focus on issues of ownership. So let me give you an example of why this work of framing a new economy agenda is so important. The politicians here in Washington are focused on tweaking the rules governing Wall Street to make it a little bit more transparent, a little bit more stable, a bit more fair, and a bit less environmentally destructive. Some say, for example, that no bank should be too big to fail, and then they debate how big is too big. We say the appropriate question is how do we replace a Wall Street financial system designed and devoted to financing speculation, financial bubbles, and usury with a banking system designed and devoted to financing the creation of real community wealth? And I'll be saying more about exactly what that means later in the presentation. Now, when I step back and look at the incredible mismatch between the economic system we have and the economic system we need, I find myself wondering whether we humans are perhaps victims of some very bad cosmic practical joke. <laughs> and as I was preparing this presentation, <laughs> The following images came to my mind. So go a little journey with me. Imagine with me the Greek gods on Mount Olympus. They've gathered in council to discuss what to do about those demanding little humans down there on that little planet called Earth who think they're so damn special, some of them even think they're gods. Zeus, the ruler of the skies, says, I propose I just wipe them out with a bolt of lightning. Well, the gods debate that idea for a bit. And eventually Hermes, the god of commerce and cunning, says, Zeus, you know, that old bolt of lightning thing, that's too easy. And don't you think it's just a little bit crude? Let's set up the humans to destroy themselves. I've got a cool idea. It involves a little illusion. I have the power to induce a trance that will make the humans perceive money, which is nothing but a number, as real wealth, as the real prize, as the measure of individual accomplishment, and of the power and glory of the nation state. This will lure those foolish humans into a fatal competition to see who can acquire the most money by converting the real living wealth of their planet into financial assets that are, in fact, nothing more than numbers in a computer. They will soon be destroying each other and ultimately their planet's biosphere and we will be rid of them by their own hand. It would be so much more amusing than a simple bolt of lightning. And most of the gods applauded. But Hestia, goddess of home and hearth, protests. You know, these humans are basically good creatures with remarkable potential. We should not destroy them for our own amusement. Besides, they're much too smart and dedicated to their families and communities to fall for that cheap trick. It won't work. Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, said, 
I agree with Hestia. Surely they will see through the illusion and love will triumph in the end. Let me awaken that love and we shall see that they are capable of much good. But Ares, god of war, and Hades, god of the underworld, overrule Aphrodite and Hestia. Ares said, let Hermes have his fun. It will provoke more war, which will indeed be very entertaining. Hades added, and they'll begin the torment of their souls even before they arrive in Hades to suffer eternally for their arrogant stupidity. I love it. So Hermes induced his trance, and unfortunately, we foolish humans fell for it. But the good news is, it isn't over yet. <laughs> Millions of people around the world, including the spiritual progressives, are waking up from the trance, walking away from Wall Street, and directing their energy to creating a new economy devoted to new objectives, new values, new rules, new institutions. Now, furthermore, as most of you know from your own experience, the work we're doing together is incredibly exciting and fun. And it brings us into association with the world's most thoughtful, creative, loving, and generous people. And of course, our gathering here is a wonderful example. That's why I so much enjoy this work. That said, it is also serious work because the institutions of the old economy threaten our very viability as a species. And it is profoundly spiritual work because it is about reestablishing our connection to community, earth, and the spirit of creation. <coughs> At its deepest level, our economic crisis is a spiritual crisis that I see framed very well by this well-known scriptural verse from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That is so appropriate to our time. Mammon, of course, refers to money as an object of worship, an obsession that alienates us from one another, nature, and the spiritual intelligence that manifests in creation. Our economic institutions can be designed either to serve money or to serve life. But no one, neither person nor corporation, can serve two masters. Scripture tells us we must choose either money or life, and it is a profound and eternal truth. We have chosen money and are paying the price. Now the work of those of us who choose service to life is to create, within a generation, a global system of human scale, interconnected local living economies that function in harmony with local bioregional ecosystems, meet the basic needs of all people, support just and democratic societies, and foster joyful community life. What I've just stated is actually the, the vision statement of the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, which is a group I'm involved in that's creating this new economy. Now you've noticed this is not exactly your standard Chamber of Commerce old economy agenda. <laughs> Many would say it is politically impossible and hopelessly naive. It is, however, essential to the human future. And therefore, we must make the politically impossible not only politically possible, but politically imperative. So we've got a little work to do. Now, even in the face of overwhelming evidence of the failure of the Wall Street-dominated economy, we have seen our political leaders fail time and again to rise to the challenge of setting a new economy course. It is in some respect for good reason. There is no alternative vision out there in the public discussion or consciousness. 